five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Robin, you and I have been doing a radio talk show for a very, very long time. Decade. And we have had, I can't even begin to tell you how many authors we've had on and how many books have been represented in every type of book imaginable. Yesterday we had this beautiful cookbook. Quite often we have novelists. Quite often we have historians. And uh, uh, some of the authors, you could be name dropping. They're so famous. And others are, are people you'll never know, but they've written these wonderful wonderfully delightful books and there's one thing that is true for 90 plus percent of them and is that is that they're at the library did you know that most of the books that we speak about are in the library so w while i'm sure the, the authors are hoping that we go out and buy the book the truth is many of them are in the library yeah we have uh, a lady on the phone she's going to talk to us about our library she is sari Feldman. She is the president of the American Library Association, and uh, I think I just heard her tell you that they're having a meeting or a, or a convention or something in Orlando? Yep, in June. Is that right? Okay, well, let me uh, push this button and start the chat. Good morning, Sari. How you doing? Hi. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from outside of Cleveland, Ohio. All right. Do you know, uh, I, it says here we want to talk about digital inc the Digital Inclusion Survey. What is that? So this is a survey that's conducted um, oh, nearly every year to take a look at what's happening in libraries, how libraries are transforming to build the digitally inclusive community. And we discovered over time, they've been doing it for about 20 years, the tremendous growth in library services that revolve around new digital tools and now digital content. So more than 90% of libraries are offering technology t training, and almost all libraries have e-books. Yeah, yes, and I, and I've actually uh, had one. I haven't, I haven't been, I, we get so many here because we do the radio show. So in a, in a way, I don't really represent the average person. Um, but you know, my mom. I want to tell you about my mom. This is probably ten years ago or so. She was uh, eighty or so. She's passed away since then. But I, she wanted to learn how to work the computer, and before her and my dad wanted to buy one. Um, I took her to the library near where she lives, and I would be there every week uh, te yep. teaching her how to use it, not to, to, to drag this out too long, but real simply, that's where she learned. And then she decided, yeah. okay, I can do this, and they bought one. So the library really helped her make that decision. Libraries today are teaching everyone how to use a mouse all the way to how to use Microsoft Excel and everything in between. Um, uh, technology instruction has become such a core service because today you really can't um, do education, employment, entrepreneurship, engagement, or empowerment without access to computers. And what you've described with your mother is such a great library story. I'm, I'm sorry she's no longer with us, but it's not just the broadband and the computer access. It's the trusted and qualified staff that support people Absol yes, learning yes. how to use these tools. I'm so, so glad you said that. One of the things we have in this town, I, I'm not trying to make this a political conversation, but we're trying to fight a... Um, um, some people want to, to privatize our public libraries, yeah. and uh, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about that, but I, we've been part of a campaign to get the county commissioners to keep it public and not yeah. privatize it. Do you have a, th a thought on that? Absolutely. I mean, public libraries today are as important as they've always been historically, and libraries are part of our you know, kind of our democratic fabric, the free society where people can have free access. And today, people need that access even more. Um, it's not just educationally or economically disadvantaged who, people who take it who use public libraries, but it's everyone. People need access to quality collections when they have a new baby. They need to learn about the importance of brain development and how they can support and prepare their child to enter school. Kids come to libraries for after-school homework help, summer reading programs, help to prevent the summer slide so that children re-enter school each year ready to learn. Um, we're helping people to 
take all kinds of education classes that ensure that they'll have 21st century workplace skills. We're giving people hands-on yeah, access. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? No wonder you're the president. You know, just going back to what, what we do, we talk to people who have something to offer. And now, now if that person has, you know, a foot cream to offer, then you there's no choice. You have to go buy it. If that person has... A, a, a song to, to buy, you have to buy it, um, you know, unless you're just going to turn on the radio and, and chance ri- listening to it. But when you have an author, do you know, uh, that's probably the only guest we have that literally has a freebie right there in the library. It's, you don't have to buy it. You could go take it out and, and, and have it on loan for as long as you need it. Well, we're the, the place of discovery for new writers and also for um, professional writers who are long tenured. People discover their love of literature or their love of a particular author, and very often we then um, encourage the purchasing of books. You know, people then want to own a book. You know, I think sometimes people don't recognize how much libraries do stimulate the economy because we're helping people get back to work, we're making sure people are well educated, we're helping people to start businesses, to expand their businesses, and, you know, we're expanding the reading market because we are that discovery platform both for print and ebook. And and the and and the libraries also provide at least in our community uh resources for uh students in particular to utilize their talent. We have a program now uh called uh, uh Create uh, through, through the public library and uh, they're, they're encouraging all of the students that have a talent if they're a singer, if they're a filmmaker if they're a, a writer a, uh, uh, um, uh, a band to come uh, come to, to the library, sign up and then they have an entire event all day where their talents can be showcased and what's wonderful about this is that if you want to embark on a career like this, the library has the resources to help you do a blueprint uh, as to try to get started. Exactly. I mean, the library, we, we always say that the library um, invented the sharing economy, things like Airbnb and Uber, because right. we have that relationship between we're the host, you're the guest, but you trust us and we trust you. So. We want to create that environment, especially for our young people, that they are safe to explore new ideas and potential careers. And all of the programs are free to the public. That's that's the other great thing about it. It is a very important piece of what we do. Well, you do s- serve the, the, the cause well as the president. <laughs> I, I, I hope we didn't go on too much of a tangent. I want to be sure that we talk about the, the topic that you actually had in mind. Um, so the, the library's transform campaign, is that about the digital inclusion part? Is, that what that, the, is it all part of the same thing? It is. You know, we want um, Americans to recognize that libraries are less about what we have for people, the stuff, and more about what we do for and with people. And the example you gave of kind of the youth showcase is a perfect example. And through that, we're increasing awareness and support for the transforming library. We want to shift the perception of libraries from obsolete or nice to have to essential. And we want to engage and energize people and build advocates who can influence local, state, and national decision makers and keep America's libraries strong and vibrant. There you go. Wow, what a great conversation. Yeah, I <laughs> love you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, thank you so much. So when are you thank coming you. to Orlando? We're coming to Orlando in June. The American Library Association, um, the largest and oldest uh, library association with more than 55,000 members, is coming to Orlando. We would expect to have more than 25,000 people there for our big convention and show, and we um, will hit town uh, on the 23rd with our show opening on the 24th of June, and we are very excited to be coming. 
All right, excellent. Well, uh, if you were a little bit closer, you might want to come into the studios, but I know you'll probably be busy. Thank you for what you've done this morning. I think just hearing you say what you said, and as eloquently as you said it, really served our purposes here. We have a lot of people in our town uh, trying to make sure that the county commission does not vote to make our public library a private, exactly. privatized. I don't, I don't think it would be a private library, but it would be operated by a private corporation, yeah. um, but still paid for by tax dollars. I, Exactly. I'll never understand that whole thing. But, yeah. Sari, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, let's leave the listeners with a website. Do you have one? Yes. Um, a- ALA.org. So it's American Library Association, ALA.org. And thank you. And thank you for all you're doing to support America's libraries and your local library. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Sari Feldman, uh, ALA.org, American Library Association. We'll take a break and be right back.